My name is Andre, and um, I, am, uh, I lead the vision team here at Tesla Autopilot, and I'm incredibly excited to be here uh, to kick off this section, giving you a technical deep dive into the Autopilot stack and showing you all the under the hood components that go into making the car drive all by itself. So we're going to start off with the vision component here. Now in the vision component, what we're trying to do is we're trying to design a neural network that processes the raw information uh, which in our case is the eight cameras that are positioned around the vehicle. And they send us images, and we need to process that in real time into what we call the vector space. And this is a three-dimensional representation of everything you need for driving. So this is the three-dimensional positions of lines, edges, curbs, uh, traffic signs, traffic lights, uh, cars, their positions, orientations, depths, velocities, and so on. What I find kind of fascinating about this is that we are effectively building a synthetic animal from the ground up. So the car can be thought of as an animal. It moves around, it senses the environment, and uh, you know, acts autonomously and intelligently. And we are building all of the components from scratch in-house. So we are building, of course, all of the mechanical components of the body, the nervous system, which is all of the electrical components, and for our purposes, the brain of the autopilot, and specifically for this section, the synthetic visual cortex. Now, the biological visual cortex actually has quite intricate structure and a number of areas uh, that organize the information flow of this brain. And so in particular, in, our, in your visual cortices, um, the information hits the um, light, hits the retina, goes through the LGN all the way to the back of your visual cortex, goes through areas V1, V2, V4, the IT, the ventral and the dorsal streams, and the information is organized in a certain layout. And so when we are designing the visual cortex of the car, we also want to design the neural network architecture of how the information flows in the system. So the processing starts in the beginning, when light hits our artificial retina, and we are going to process this information with neural networks. Now, I'm going to roughly organize this section um, chronologically. So starting off with some of the neural networks and what they looked like roughly four years ago when I joined the team and how they have developed over time. So roughly um, four years ago, the car was mostly driving in a single lane going forward on the highway, and so it had to keep lane and it had to keep distance away from the car in front of us. And at that time, all of processing was only on individual image level. So a single image has to be analyzed by a neural net and make little pieces of the vector space, uh, process that into a little pieces of the vector space. So this processing um, took the following shape. We take a 1280 by 960 input, and this is 12-bit integers streaming in at roughly 36 hertz. Now we're going to process that with a neural network. So we instantiate a feature extractor backbone. In this case, we use residual neural networks. So we have a stem and a number of residual blocks connected in series. Now the specific class of ResNets that we use are RegNets, uh, because we this is like a very, RegNets offer a very nice design space for neural networks, because they allow you to very nicely trade off latency and uh, accuracy. Now these RegNets give us, as an output, a number of features at different resolutions and different scales. So in particular, on the very bottom of this feature hierarchy, we have very high resolution information with very low channel counts, and all the way at the top, we have low, spatial, low resolution spatially, but high channel counts. So on the bottom, we have a lot of neurons that are really scrutinizing the detail of the image, and on the top, we have neurons that can see most of the image and a lot of that context, have a lot of that seen context. We then like to process this with feature pyramid networks. In our case, we like to use BiFPNs, and they get, the mul they get to multiple scales to talk to each other effectively and share a lot of information. So for example, if you're a neuron all the way down in the network and you're looking at a small patch and you're not sure if this is a car or not, it definitely helps to know from the top layers that, hey, you are actually in the vanishing point of this highway. And so that helps you disambiguate that this is probably a car. After a BiFPN and a feature fusion across scales, we then go into task-specific heads. So for example, if you are doing object detection, we have a one-stage YOLO-like object detector here where we initialize a raster, and there's a binary bit per position telling you whether or not there's a car there. And then in addition to that, if there is, here's a bunch of other attributes you might be interested in. So the XY with height offset, or any of the other attributes, like what type of a car is this, and so on. So this is for the detection by itself. Now, very quickly we discovered that we don't just want to detect cars, we want to do a large number of tasks. So, for example, we want to do traffic light recognition and detection, a lane prediction, and so on. So very quickly we converged in this kind of a architectural layout where there's a common shared backbone and then branches off into a number of heads. 
So we call these, uh, therefore, hydra nets, and these are the heads of the hydra. Now, this architectural layout has a number of benefits. So number one, uh, because of the feature sharing, we can amortize the forward pass inference uh, in the car at test time. And so this is very efficient to run. Um, because if we had to have a backbone for every single task, uh, that would be a lot of backbones in the car. Number two, this decouples all of the tasks, so we can individually work on every one task in isolation. And for example, we can, uh, we can uprev any of the data sets or change some of the architecture of the head and so on, and you are not impacting any of the other tasks. And so we don't have to revalidate all the other tasks, which can be expensive. And number three, because there's this bottleneck here in features, um, what we do fairly often is that we actually cache these features to disk and when we are doing these fine-tuning uh, workflows, we only fine-tune from, from the cached features up and only fine-tune the heads. So most often, in terms of our training workflows, you, we will do an end-to-end -end training run once in a while where we train everything jointly. Then we cache the features um, at the multi-scale feature level, and then we fine-tune off of that for a while, and then end-to-end -end train once again, and so on. So here's the kinds of predictions that we were obtaining, I would say, several years ago now, uh, from one of these hydronets. So again, we are processing individual images. There we go. We are processing just individual image, and we're making a large number of predictions about these images. So for example, here you can see predictions of the stop signs, uh, the stop lines, uh, the lines, the edges, the cars, uh, the traffic lights, uh, the curbs here, uh, whether or not the car is parked, uh, all of the static objects like trash cans, cones, and so on, and everything here is coming out of the net, uh, here in this case, out of the hydronet. So that was all fine and great, but as we worked towards FSD, we quickly found that this is not enough. So where this first started to break was when we started to work on Smart Summon. Here I am showing some of the predictions of only the curb detection task, and I'm showing it now for every one of the cameras. So we'd like to wind our way around the parking lot to find the person who is summoning the car. Now the problem is that you can't just directly drive on image space predictions. You actually need to cast them out and form some kind of a vector space around you. Um, so we attempted to do this using C++ and developed uh, what we called uh, the occupancy tracker at the time. So here we see that the curb detections from the images are being stitched up across camera scenes, camera boundaries, and over time. Now there were two, pro two major problems I would say with the setup. Number one, we very quickly discovered that tuning the occupancy tracker and all of its hyperparameters was extremely complicated. You don't want to do this explicitly by hand in C++. You want this to be inside the neural network and train that end to end. Number two, we very quickly discovered that the image space is not the correct output space. Uh, you don't want to make predictions in image space, you really want to make it directly in the vector space. So here's a way of illustrating the issue. So here I'm showing on the first row the predictions of our curbs and our lines in red and blue. And uh, they look great in the image, but once you cast them out into the vector space, things start to look really terrible, and we are not gonna be able to drive on this. So you see how the predictions are quite bad? in vector space, and the reason for this fundamentally is because you need to have an extremely accurate depth per pixel in order to actually do this projection. And so you can imagine just how high of a bar it is to predict that depth so accurately in these tiny, in every single pixel of the image. And also if there's any occluded area where you'd like to make predictions, you will not be able to because it's not an image uh, space uh, concept in that case. So we very quickly, uh, real, uh, the other problems with this, by the way, is also for object detection. If you are only making predictions per camera, then sometimes you will encounter cases like this where a single car actually spans five of the eight cameras. And so if you are making individual predictions, then no single camera since sees all of the car, and so obviously you're not going to be able to do a very good job of predicting that whole car, and it's going to be incredibly difficult to fuse these measurements. So we have this intuition that what we'd like to do instead is we'd like to take all of the images and simultaneously feed them into a single neural net and directly output in vector space. Now this is very easily said, much more difficult to, to actually achieve, but roughly we want to lay out a neural net in this way where we process every single image with a backbone and then we want to somehow fuse them <laughs> and we want to re-represent uh, the, the features from image space features to directly some kind of a vector space features and then go into the decoding of the head. Now, uh, so there are two problems with this. Problem number one, how do you actually create the neural network components that do this transformation? Um, and you have to make it differentiable so that end-to-end -end training is possible. And number two, uh, 
the, if you want vector space predictions from your neural net, you need vector space data sets. So just labeling images and so on is not going to get you there. You need vector space labels. We're going to talk a lot more about problem number two later in the talk. For now, I want to focus on the neural network architectures, so I'm going to deep dive into uh, problem number one. So here's the rough problem, right? We're trying to have this bird's eye view prediction instead of image space predictions. So for example, let's focus on the single pixel in the output space in yellow. And this pixel is trying to decide, am I part of a curb or not, as an example. And now, where should the support for this kind of a prediction come from in the image space? Well, we know roughly how the cameras are positioned and their extrinsics and intrinsics, so we can roughly project this point into the camera images, and you know, the evidence for whether or not this is a curb may come from somewhere here in the images. The problem is that this projection is really hard to actually get correct because it is a function of the road surface. The road surface could be sloping up or sloping down, or also there could be other data dependent issues. For example, there could be occlusion due to a car. So if there's a car occluding this, this uh, viewport, this, this part of the image, then actually you may want to pay attention to a different part of the image, uh, not the part where it projects. And so because this is data dependent, it's really hard to have a fixed transformation for this at some point.